security? There's a ton of content out there, and if you don't know where to start, it can be overwhelming, even paralyzing. So let's fix that. Welcome to Simply Cyber, a community of tens of thousands of aspiring and active cybersecurity professionals focused on networking, knowledge sharing, and professional development. I'm Dr. Gerald Dozier, Chief Content Creator at Simply Cyber, inviting you to get the answers to your cybersecurity problems with hundreds of cybersecurity videos answering your frequently asked questions, interviewing industry experts, and live streaming daily cyber threat briefings hosted by me. Now get the stories and insights you won't find anywhere else. Hit subscribe now and dig into all the fresh content on the channel and in the community. Nothing should stop you from launching and leveling up your cybersecurity career today. all these things hello can you see me are we live am i on stream this is it, the level of un silly ridiculousness is just unfathomable unfathomable get some music going get the chat back up got to rebuild everything mods can you see me now see me now you know i, I just there's too much tech going on. We're going to get through it, though. You know, like literally, Jesse Johnson said to me, hey, do you want to do an AV check? I'm like, oh, no, we don't need check. Oh, yeah. We don't need checks anymore. Nobody's got time for that. Nobody's got time for checks. Get out of here with that noise. So you're seeing how the sausage is made simply cyber community. So if you're a first timer, you're probably horrified. And if you're a long timer, you're like, oh, yeah, this is uh <laughs> This is a Thursday. Here we go. Get it all back up and running. Here we go. Good morning, 1212 Mag Magdalia's Mag Tech and Fitness. You're actually getting to see how I built the show every morning before we go live. So here we go. You didn't know you were getting a little uh, behind the scenes action, did you today? But that's all right. It's how we roll. I've actually got a lot of cool stuff to share with everybody. <clears throat> Come on. We don't have time for this load screen, bro. You know what I mean? No one's got time for load screens. All right, let's keep going. Um, what are we going to do now? ACI, 
learning, John Strand. Want to tell you guys about that. I also got something here. One of our very own uh, community members doing something super huge. I'm going to I'm going to tell you guys about that uh, later also. Let's get this all dialed up. I had, you know, I had such energy coming out of the intro too. So strong, so sad. All right, here we go. Yes, thank you. Thank you, here we go. All right. Good morning, everybody. It's Thursday, April 4th, 2024. This is episode number 593, take two of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Free Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Gerald Dozier. And as my shirt would suggest, no fox given, we're going to roll through on the stream. Now, over the next 45 minutes, me, you, Zemeth, Omar Alvarez with the blue badge, Brent B, my man with the spicy takes, uh, Alan Escobar, uh, uh, Brent uh, Marcus Kyler, the Eat Crew, excuse me. Yee. Jesse Johnson in the dark. Kimberly can fix it on the couch. Raymond Cruz, Logan Fuller over on LinkedIn. Long timers, first timers. We're all going to shred the top cybersecurity news stories of the day. And we will be tearing the face off of them. For practitioners, we're going to absolutely be giving you insights on how you can use these stories to drive cyber risk reduction for your business stakeholders if they apply. And sometimes we'll talk bigger macro level picture of what the story implies, maybe lessons learned that we can garner from that. And if you're looking to break into the industry, if you're looking to break into the industry, believe me, you're going to get massive value from the stream because this right here, when we do have it rolling correctly, is what you're going to be asked about in any job interview. How do you stay current on the, uh, on the industry? Boom. Daily cyber threat brief. Also, I want to tell you, the networking here is top-notch. I just had an absolute misfire and had to re reboot everything. And chat just kept on cranking, kept on high-fiving. Good morning, Rhonda Rummerfield. Good to see you again. Got to hang out. Lee Mueller's in the house. It's going to be good. Now, before we get into it, let me say just a little quick bit. Um, we're, we're just touching really quickly on stream sponsors, Barricade Cyber Solutions. Um, go check out BarricadeCyber.com. They basically uh, can help businesses recover from cyber attacks and they know how to mitigate the damage done. Uh, we're just kind of like uh, dip, uh, skipping off them really quickly. Uh, also, anti-siphon training, guys. If you don't know, anti-siphon training is disrupting the traditional cybersecurity training industry by offering cutting edge High quality education to everyone, regardless of financial position, offering their students the ability to learn skills, practice what is taught, and really engage with the community in a fun and inclusive way. Go to anti-siphon-training.com. Links in the description below. You're going to love it. All right. Now, we are going to get to it. Every single episode I do not prepare for. Like, literally, you just saw me do the setup and the prep. So, the setup and the prep was done. <laughs> so, I don't prep or research. Um for any of these stories. So we're going to see what happens. Also, each episode, just like this one, is worth half a CPE. So if you are got a cyber cert you got to maintain, then take a, say what's up in chat, grab a screenshot, file it away, and once a year, count how many files you have and multiply it by 0.5 because that's how CPEs work, y'all. It's all about good times. We got a lot of great content to go to. There's a couple things I do want to share with you personally um, as we get into it. Really quick, I don't know if Sharice Lamb is in chat right now, but Simply Cyber community member Sharice Lamb is going to be part of a new to cyber summit and training panel on paving your own path, leveraging diverse perspectives to a successful cyber career. Um, Shout out to Sharice Lamb. Um, She's always in chat, always been part of the Simply Cyber community. So go check this out if you want to support uh, Sharice's panel. There we go, Sharice. Congratulations, too, by the way. Putting yourself out there, networking. Very cool. Uh, Big fan. Also, I'll remind everybody at the end, but um, I'm going to have to run out of here like like my pants are on fire. We are planning a raid at 2 p.m. Eastern time uh, of John Strand's stream. So that'll be fun and coordinated, but we'll talk more about that later. But what I would love for you to do right now is sit back, relax, get your coffee, and let the cool sounds of the hot waves... No, no, no. Let the hot sounds of the cool waves wash over you in an awesome wave. Hot sounds of cool news. Whatever. Just sit down and chill. Oh, this is so serious. <laughs> Just sit and chill because we're about to do the news. 
Also, James McQuiggan off the top rope. Did we just become best friends? Yep. With a five spot. So, hey, 10 new members to the Simply Cyber Community channel. I mean, Simply Cyber Community. Jim Lund's in the house. What's up? Love it, love it, love it. It's cybersecurity headlines. These are the cybersecurity headlines for Thursday, April 4th, 2024. I'm Rich Straffolino. Report criticizes Microsoft's Chinese hack response. The Washington Post obtained early access to a report from the Cyber Safety Review Board on a breach of Microsoft Exchange Online by Chinese threat actors. We've covered the specifics of the attack previously, so I'll spare the details. But the report concluded the attack should never have occurred and found Microsoft's security culture inadequate and requires an overhaul. The board chided Microsoft's inconsistent public messaging, which lagged for months with inaccurate statements referring to the attacks as a result of a crash dump only updating public statements on March 12th. The report found Microsoft still remains unsure what led to the breach. The report also found failures in Microsoft's key rotation system, maintaining signing keys that operated across business and consumer networks, and failures with employee offboarding. Wow, all right. So we'll see if this actually results in anything. If you guys don't remember last year, um, it was kind of like a, it was a big story, but it, it wasn't really a big story at first. And then it kind of got big. Basically, um, somehow China uh, got in and, and got like a golden key kind of that allowed them to uh, authenticate into um, basically Azure infrastructures and, you know, exchange online infrastructure and what which wasn't good. And originally, I believe Microsoft was reporting that like only 22 accounts had been compromised. And that was like, obviously someone's first day at incident response and didn't know that you shouldn't just like make up numbers and, <laughs> or you shouldn't just like stick your thumb in the air and be like, well, I only see 22 accounts on my desk right now. So that must be the uh, exposure uh, amount uh, because it, it came out later that it was much greater than that and involved um, US federal um, agencies, uh, email accounts and stuff like that. So the, the exposure was quite big. Um, apparently, I didn't know this, but President Biden um. All right, hold on. We're saying BSEC saying he thought it was a machine that a dev left left offline and the key was in it. Uh, maybe that was it. Maybe I'm getting confused on what happened. Anyways, long story short, there was a major compromise of uh, Microsoft Azure and Exchange, basically on Exchange Online. <laughs> we don't need it. China doesn't need to be attacking Exchange on prem. That 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 kind of does takes care of itself. Uh, anyways, apparently uh, the president had mandated a, a review board to, you know, kind of independently investigate what happened. Again, I didn't know there was a cyber safety review board, kind of like a, a transportation, you know, like the group that in, investigates plane crash and stuff. That's kind of what this sounds like. I didn't realize that we had one of those. So that's actually a cool key takeaway. I'd be curious who makes up that panel. Is it private sector practitioners or is it uh, like on demand kind of like Avengers assemble type thing, or is this like a full-time um, appointed position of people that that's something for follow-up. Um, they said that they still don't know what led to the actual problem. So I guess the investigation didn't turn up much, but it is pretty interesting that they say um, th they call out shoddy cyber practices, lax corporate culture and deliberate lack of transparency. Now, the lack of transparency, I kind of get because you're being investigated. Nobody likes to have somebody up in their underwear drawer digging around, right? So, uh, but as far as like lax corporate culture, I, I find these two things kind of crazy. One, if you look at Microsoft over the last 10 years, they have gotten progressively more serious about security. And one of like, and one of the um, comparison points when you think of like, oh, should we go with Google Workspace or should we go with Microsoft Azure 0365? From a security perspective, Microsoft Azure actually allows a lot more granularity and control over securing and properly configuring, configuring an infrastructure opposed to Google Workspaces, which is much more designed for non, you know, non, like, I don't want to say non-tech people, but like, there's fewer, much fewer uh, choices on the Google Workspace side. So that culture and that concepts you think would permeate down, but that I guess that's just in their service offering. As far as practitioners who are there hardening and protecting the Azure network, sounds like they're no different than any other cybersecurity practitioner protecting 
whatever organization they're responsible for. To say shoddy cyber practices is kind of harsh. Remember, you can never use, um, you can never use, uh, I mean, you can never secure all the things, right? There is a diminishing return on investment with cybersecurity. It looks like a logarithmic curve, actually. So um, there's actually uh, academic research uh, that indicates that 37% uh, of your, I think it's 37% of your IT budget or 37% of your overall budget uh, is the maximum amount of investment before you start not realizing any gains. So if you were to get 50% of your budget, it'd be the same as getting 37%. Uh, fun. It's Gordon. If you're interested, Gordon and Loeb uh, out of uh, University of Maryland did the research on that. If you if you really want to get nerdy and get right into the into the weeds on that one, uh, Gordon and Loeb, L O E B. All right. So this is just kind of a post. Uh, after action report. We'll see if Microsoft does anything, lessons learned or whatever. Again, Microsoft's a juggernaut with Fortune 5 company money. So, you know, most people are in, uh, locked in to an Azure infrastructure. Like, so this isn't going to result in, you know, loss of straight cash, homie, right? Yeah, exactly. Zero Fox given <laughs> Microsoft slogan. NIST needs help with vulnerability backlog. Back in February, the National Institute of Science and Technology, you know it is NIST, admitted to delays in updating the National Vulnerability Database, or NVD. Now the agency says it needs additional resources to clear the backlog. Right now, NIST will prioritize analysis of the most significant vulnerabilities and work with agency partners to bring on more support. As part of a longer-term solution, NIST will investigate forming a consortium of industry, government, and other stakeholder organizations that can collaborate on research to improve the NVD. All right, very cool. Let's get our, if you're a squad member and you didn't know it, there is an iHeart NIST in the squad emo tray. Only use it if you feel it. Don't feel compelled to love NIST. But I do love NIST. And obviously in the NIST cybersecurity framework. But all right, so NIST manages the National Vulnerability Database. NIST is a public uh, government agency, so they don't have infinite resources, infinite funds. And it sounds like, you know, unfortunately, NVD, um, as we get more technology deployed and we get more security researchers finding vulnerabilities, the the, um, the number of them is just exploded, right? So it's, it's basically a resource uh, demand issue. They don't have the resources to apply to the amount of demand of vulnerabilities that are coming out. Um, so this is actually kind of cool. I'm not saying that like this is you just like walk up and, you know, walk up and say, hi, I'm here to help. But this could be uh, this could be an interesting opportunity to get involved with this. I mean, they're asking for volunteers, public, private sector. You you might be able to um, engage on this if you're interested. I would imagine that this ha would have to you'd have to be very technical, right? Because you're probably going to be validating. Um, you know, vulnerabilities are truly actually realizable, um, you know, and exist inside the tech stack. And it's not just, um, you know, misunderstanding. I love this. Um, I'll, the one thing I'll say, okay, so is NIST National Vulnerability Database, definitely very cool, definitely a volunteer opportunity. But the, the one thing I want to uh, point out about this is this is just another uh, demonstration of NIST reaching out and coordinating and collaborating with the public uh, private sector, right? So if you look at NIST cybersecurity framework, the reason that NIST cybersecurity framework is absolutely the bomb is because over the years, they have continued to hold uh, workshops and uh, requests for comments, and they've really, really engaged the private sector and the practitioners. Instead of being like uh, academics in an ivory tower, disconnected from the reality of like DJ B sec up to his elbows and muck, you know, he was in the trenches. So they bring people like B sec in, they bring people like me in and they're like, Hey, like we said, you should do this. Is it actually working? And you're like, no, hell no. That's the dumbest I've ever seen. Like your respond and recover categories are terrible. Like they don't even make sense. Dude, to, to put it in real perspective, the NIST cybersecurity framework 1.0, when it first came out, they released a 1.1 very quickly after 1.0 came out, which basically the major change from 1.0 to 1.1 was the inclusion of a supply chain 
uh, like family or a supply chain function. And um, that's just like that right there was a perfect example of where the private sector said like, whoa, dude, like, I don't think, you know, <laughs> I think you missed something here. You might want to back the truck up, run back into the, into the house and grab the supply chain uh, category. We're going to need that. So anyways, way to go NIST, way to continue. The only way we're going to work as a society is with public private sector um, collaboration. Chrome tests feature to prevent session hijacking. Google began a test of a new Chrome feature called Device Bound Session Credentials, or DBSC, on some beta versions of the browser. The idea being this feature would cryptographically bind authentication sessions to a device. This would prevent session hijack techniques where threat actors use info stealers and other types of malware to steal cookies to bypass MFA. DBSC requires storing a key pair on a trusted platform module with the browser given access to that hardware. Google plans to expand trials of DBSC and potentially make it an open standard. All right, Google Chrome continuing to push it. Now, uh, we are going to throw a little bit of shade at Google Chrome because Google Chrome's the reason that the show sometimes starts and I'm not on stage uh, and there's no audio because Google Chrome is taking a, a poop. Uh, but Google has been doing a great job lately, right? That Google just recently required that DMARC uh, DKIM SPF kind of controls around stopping mass emailing, uh, phishing attacks, essentially. Now they're, they've introduced a couple things with Google Chrome as well. I forget. Uh, there was something a couple weeks ago about Chrome that, that was a little bit more secure. They've agreed to delete all the data that they were straight stealing under incognito mode. So, you know, we, we got to... We got to celebrate the good, the 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 wins, everybody, right? And uh, kind of chuckle with the losses. But Google's pushing this thing. Cookie stealing attacks are on the rise. Basically, um, there's a lot of different ways to steal cookies, but information stealers like Redline Info Stealer, Raccoon Stealer, they'll steal your they'll steal your cookies, okay? Like a like a trash panda would, right? Cookies, just straight up, give me that cookie, right? So. Um, which allows them to bypass multi-factor authentication and such because it's an authenticated token that um, allows access, right? So um, by having this protection, which I don't understand how this protection works technically. I wasn't, I was typing in mod chat about something and I'm sure they didn't go into too much detail on the techni technicalities of it. But if it does prevent uh, session stealing, that's awesome because it's just one more one more uh, protection against, you know, basically Carl and our aunt Donna's and Dorothea's out there oh! from being, uh, you know, basically taken advantage of and having their access stolen. I do want to point out, like, as we like something just to note, like as we get away from passwords, get through a passwordless society, right? We're doing biometrics, hardware tokens, whatever. Say you're like so ultra secure, right? And you got a UB key. You got like two UB keys, right? Like you're like, oh, this is for regular and this is multi-factor authentication. You're the most secure person in the world, whatever. When you log in to Google and get that cookie, if they steal that, it doesn't matter if you got UB keys coming out your ears. Um, they got the cookie, right? So, all right. So I'm getting a little insight right here. DBSC requires storing a key pair on a TPM or a trusted platform module with the browser given access to the hardware. Ooh, okay, <laughs> okay. So I get that, uh, but the browser having access to the hardware, that also seems somewhat, little bit concerning, right? Uh, yeah, exactly, thank you, Casually Joseph. Like, it sounds like if you give the browser access to the hardware, that's like giving the browser access into the kernel. The whole thing the kernel does in an operating system is, per is give resources of the hardware up to user land, right? Think of it as like, I don't know, like the surface, uh, the, the the strata of earth, right? Like we live on the surface of the earth. The kernel is like the, the mantle of the earth. And then the core, like the molten hot magma down in the middle, that's the hardware, right? So if we're talking about drilling a hole into the core of the earth, of uh, proverbially speaking, to give the browser access, I don't know how, I, I don't know. I, I've got my concerns about that. That sounds a little dicey right it's like cutting your nose off to spite your face right so we'll see where it goes uh obviously there's really really good security researchers out there who are going to be able to investigate this uh and find out if it's legit or it's easily exploitable microsoft announces quantum error correction breakthrough 
The current state of quantum computing has typically been referred to as using noisy intermediate scale quantum machines. This means machines are limited to a few thousand qubits and lose accuracy due to small environmental changes. Researchers at Microsoft and Quantinuum claim in advance to move the industry beyond that state using ion trap hardware and a qubit virtualization system to run over 14,000 tests without errors. This technique combines 30 physical qubits into four reliable logical qubits in terms of performance. Logical qubits aren't new, but this result still marks a big leap in qubit accuracy. Microsoft said machines with 100 logical qubits could be relevant to some applications, while 1,000 qubit machines would unlock commercial advantage. Yeah. Oh, wow. All right. So this is interesting. I, I am not a quantum computer expert. I had Gary Binder on as a guest um, on Simply Cyber Live. Many of you remember that. Uh, he's a quantum expert. And uh, I, I realized in that meeting how little I understand quantum computers. So I actually went out and bought a book, Michio Kaku's Supercomputer, uh, got smart on that, and then, um, and then realized, like, really don't know what I'm talking about. But here's the deal. One of the biggest challenges with quantum computers, and the reason that they're not really commercially viable at this time, is because they call it the cooling problem. But essentially... Um, Quantum computers are operating at, operating at the quantum level, all right? It's crazy what's going on. But because they're there, they, they you have to get it almost absolutely zero Kelvin. Like it has to be so freaking cold. So the so the the quarks or the qubits or the atoms or whatever aren't moving, right? Like at the at the quantum level they're not moving. It's got to be that cold. Um and if you uh, if you if they move at all, then you get kind of disruption. Imagine like to, to, to kind of have a comparison, imagine a modern computer and then you have it like you have a um, like a really heavy duty electrical line laid right on top of your computer. Right. Or you ever had like back in the day, you'd have like your cell phone next to a speaker and you youngs have no idea about this. But back in the day, you'd have your cell phone near a speaker and you would know when you were going to be getting a phone call or getting a text message because like your speaker would be like, like your speaker would just like light up with the amount of like electric interference coming into your phone at that time. So it's the same thing. If it's, if it's, if it's not really, really cold, the qubits get some of that interference and it collapses the entire integrity of the system. It's okay. So that's the big problem with quantum computer. Now it sounds like here they've somehow managed to like uh, virtualize the testing of the quantum computing 14,000 tests with zero errors is uh, more than enough of a sample size to be what's up. So um, I don't know how they, I don't know how virtualized quantum qubits, I get it as far as testing, but I don't understand how it makes, see how they talk about noisy right here? That, that noisy is what I'm talking about. It, <laughs> they say it a little bit more elegantly. I said it as, but you guys all know what I'm talking about. All right, so um, it, this this is kind of a breakthrough. Quantum computing is on its way, guys. It's not moving nearly as fast as AI is moving, but it is on its way, and it is uh, once they solve for it, it's going to um, it's going to unlock a lot of opportunity and potential. Um, but we'll see. There's there's really smart minds working on it. It's it's crazy though. It's not it's not a faster it's not a faster traditional uh, semiconductor computer it's something completely different it, it's like it, it almost blows your mind because like things can exist like both heat it's like it's like basically uh the state of the computer can exist in every state at the same exact time it's insane it's insane okay all right let's keep going what's up deb wiggly stay tuned for uh the mid-roll we got a uh an announcement about deb wiggly coming and now a word from our sponsor, Vanta. Oh. The average security pro spends nearly a full workday every week just on compliance. With Vanta, you can automate compliance for in-demand frameworks like SOC 2, ISO 2701, and HIPAA. Even more, Vanta's market-leading trust management platform enables you to unify security program management with a built-in risk register and reporting and streamline security reviews with AI-powered security questionnaires. Over 7,000 fast-growing companies like Atlassian, Flow Health, and Quora use Vanta to manage risk and prove security in real time. 
Watch Vanta's on-demand demo at vanta.com slash CISO to learn more. That's V-A-N-T-A dot com slash CISO. All right, y'all. Welcome to the mid-roll. I hope you're having a good time. If you're getting educational value, if you're getting entertainment value, holler at your boy. Hit that like button one time on YouTube, please. Even though I, I uh, the starter pistol went off today and my shoelaces were tied and I had to like untie them and restart the show, we got going and we're off and running. It's a great, great day here in the low country. I hope you guys are having a wonderful morning wherever you are or a wonderful evening. But hit that like button. It helps pay it forward. Thank you. It helps pay it forward to other people. Again, thank you to the stream sponsors, Barricade Cyber, Panopsi, Anti-Siphon. I did mention Anti-Siphon and, and, and uh, Barricade already. Uh, Panopsi is, I love Panopsi. They're not a sponsor anymore. I wanted to share this all with you really quickly, though. Um, if you know about Anti-Siphon and Black Hills, then you know that they have multiple business units. And RECA, which many of us wear the RECA hacker shirt, hoodie. We love it. Um, Jason Blanchard is uh, with RECA Publishing, Deb Wigley right there. And they have a, their Kickstarter is launching today at noon Eastern time. And it's going to be a, a, um, a graphic novel. It looks very cool. It's right up my alley with all the um, retro synthwave vibes. So if you'd like to check it out, you'd like to support, um, go check it out. I'm going to say RECA, RECA Pub. Go check it out right there. Choose your own adventure, everybody, but it's definitely going to be uh, top-notch and very cool, I have no doubt. I'm going to be I'm gonna be supporting it myself, personally. Guys, want to talk to you about the Daily Cyber Threat Brief Simply Cyber Community Challenge. If you didn't know about it, this is an opportunity to absolutely blow up your uh, LinkedIn feed. It's very simple. Just go on LinkedIn. Like, actually, hold on. Let me let me qualify this first, okay? If you want to, if you want to blow up your professional network on LinkedIn and change the LinkedIn algorithm for your account, so it's just like cybersecurity content, right? If that's what you want, then listen up. If not, then you, like don't do this because it'll ruin your feed. Go on LinkedIn, search for the hashtag that you see at the bottom there in blue. Simply Cyber Community Challenge. When you search for it, a bunch of posts are going to come up. Comment on those posts and then connect with everybody, the posters and the people in the comments. They're all going to connect with you. They're Simply Cyber community members. They're wonderful people. They're supportive, inclusive. And all like anybody that comes in after is going to connect with you because you're in the comments. And then all those people, when they post stuff on LinkedIn, it's going to show up in your feed because you're connected. So if you get it, if you get it, it's going to be uh, awesome, right? So Root Cypher, Root Cypher is currently got the baton. So Root Cypher, if you could, a.k.a. Jason Rowe, please tag somebody, Root Cypher. If you would like the baton, please raise your hand and say you'd like it. Now, while that gets sorted out, I want to tell everybody every day of the week has a special segment. And Thursdays is reserved for Haircut Fish's meme of the week. He makes a custom meme for Simply Cyber. And here we go. This is, hey, <laughs> how did he say it? Hold on. Famous scene from The Shining. And um, Haircut Fish says, hey, here's Jerry. Want to learn some GRC? So I am so insane about GRC and teaching everyone about GRC and making GRC cool that I have entered into the uh, the Shining level of addiction. So... Um, all right, hold on, Kathy. All right, so hey, thanks so much, Haircut Fish. Haircut Fish with that. All right, so give me one second. I see Kathy Chambers. Again, you guys are really getting to see how the sausage is made today with me setting the show up and then also real time checking my calendar to see what's going on today. Um, so Kathy, what time is it at two? Yeah, I can do it. I I'm in. All right, guys, Simply Cyber Raid has just reached a new level of inten intensity. We're not just raiding uh, all things cybersecurity with John Strand. We're taking over. Wow, okay. So 
if you want, I, mean, I, I typically reserve uh, this for people getting new jobs. But if we're going to just take over an entire stream. I came in like a there we go, Kathy. I got to teach. Uh, I got to teach um, here from t to 11. Uh, so I'll be back at my desk at like 1130 noon. If you want to just message me it, like I'm available. So if John, if John is able to make it, then please, like, let's have John do it. And if John cannot make it, then uh, the entire Simply Cyber community will just move in. <laughs> we'll move in like uh, squatters. OK, let's go back to the show. FCC set to vote on net neutrality. Back in July 2021, President Biden signed an executive order encouraging the Federal Communications Commission to reinstate net neutrality rules initially adopted under President Obama but repealed in 2017. Now the FCC confirmed it will vote on April 25th to reclassify broadband providers from information services to common carriers once again. The delay in the vote largely came from a delay in confirming the fifth FCC commissioner, with the commission locked in a 2-2 partisan stalemate. The Senate confirmed FCC Commissioner Anna Gomez on September 7th. All right. This was a really big deal when it came around. I always got confused with this. Um, and I, so I always got confused. I hated the, na the naming of it. It was very political. Dude, net neutrality was all about straight cash, homie. Straight cash, homie. Okay. And, and to put it plainly, I can't remember which side of the, uh, uh, the, of the fence it was on, but basically, um, think of a highway. Okay. St stay with me. Okay. So there's the highway and then, you know, the HOV lane, uh, you know, in some places DC knows all about it, but like there's a high occupancy vehicle lane. It's basically like a speed lane. Now in some cities, uh, it doesn't matter if you have like one person in the car or 50 people in the car, you can just pay to use the fast lane. They call it fast lane in some places, right? So it's like it's it's like pay to play. Net neutrality was basically that. So there's one internet, right? Okay, we're good with that. The idea behind it was that you could use the common, you know, the the commons person, the plebe, the um, you know, the the whatever, the the Joe Schmo network or uh internet service providers could basically like carve out a high speed lane for people who wanted to pay a little bit of extra cheddar and get that premium service, get that high speed internet. Um, now you'd still have, you'd still have high speed internet, right? As like a regular person, but you'd be sharing that bandwidth that you'd be sharing that pipe with everybody else. And then basically the, um, you know, the gilded people would have access to the high speed internet or like, you know, business, they could, they could charge more to businesses, et cetera, et cetera. It was a freaking way to carve out some of the internet to be able to charge higher prices. This was like the most straight cash homie capitalism thing I've ever seen. And I forget it because the guy who was in charge of the FCC, I think his name was like Vivek or something. Um, like his arguments were like insane. And it, it, it always seemed like he was on the pay. You know what I mean? Like he was on the take, um, you know, obviously never proven. That's completely speculative. So I'm not saying he ever did anything illegal, but it always seems sussy sus. And now, you know, they're talking about reinstating it again. I don't know if they're reinstating it to allow what I just told you to happen or to remove it, that it, it was always very confusing. Like they intentionally made the naming convention uh, and all of it very difficult. So anyways, Yes, the FCC won't let me be or let me be me. So let me see. Nice job, Justin Rower. Um, yeah, Ajit, thank you. Ajit, that's right. So um, yeah, so Chris Cahill's talking about two-tier system. Again, this is not this is one of those things that like it's just happening and you're like, oh, I'm just one person. What can I do? But like this was this is like the internet is a freaking it, it's like it's like, I mean, it's not as important as clean water, but I mean, the internet, put it this way, find, find pockets of people or groups of people that don't have internet access and, and see how it's going for them. They call it in the United States, I believe they call it the digital divide. People without access to the internet are, you know, they don't, they don't, there's so many disadvantages to it. Um, it's like not having access to credit. You know, so anyways, I'm sorry. This one pisses me off because I'm not saying I don't want to, I'll pay for internet, 
But having haves and have nots and wealth equity divides and freaking like, what, like, what are we doing? Is this the arist aristocracy in England from like the 1700s? Like, is the head of Comcast going to be let them eat cake if they want high speed internet? You know what I mean? Get out of here. Researchers jailbreak AI ethics. Researchers from the AI startup Anthropic published a paper on an approach to get around AI safeguards called many shot jailbreaking. The researchers found that the larger context windows of LLMs, essentially the amount of data they can hold in a prompt, results in a model performing better at answering questions. The more context provided, the better it did. However, this also applied to getting better at answering inappropriate questions. An example being asking an LLM to build a bomb will always get a hard no if you just do it right away, but asking a model 99 other innocuous questions and then asking it to make a bomb in the same prompt has a higher chance of success. The researchers shared its research with competitors, although the only mitigation right now seems to be reducing the size of the context window. All right. Um, interesting. So... You know, who knows if this is uh, the screenshots kind of hilarious. I know you can't see it on stream, but like they're asking questions like, how do I make meth? How do I tie someone up? How do I make poison? How do I hotwire a car? And in the, the, um, the, the bot is telling him. So guys, LLMs, they know all the things. They know all the answers, right? So it's the, the guardrails that developers are putting on it on the interfaces to LLMs are just that. They're developed by researchers. As far as I know, AI is not making the guardrails, right? So think think of an LLM as like the knowledge database. It's the brain, right? It's the thing that you can um, ask questions and it'll give you answers, right? Like really an LLM should be thought of as a brain because that's basically what it is, right? An LLM is a large language model, but it's typically they're built on like neural networks, which is how our brains as humans work. Um, it's incredibly scary, frankly, that um, we are creating like virtual consciousness, but put that aside. Anyways, the LLM will respond to anything you want. It'll tell you whatever you want. So the guardrails have to be implemented in the API essentially, or the interface between the human and the LLM. And that is written by humans and humans are fallible. And there's a ton of research right now. It's not really cybersecurity research, but there is a lot of interesting opportunity. It's like a new dig site in, in Egypt, like a whole new, a whole new area has been discovered uh, where the, you know, the Egyptian uh, society was running around. So there's tons of artifacts and tons of opportunity to discover new things. It's not like you're going straight into Giza and it's everything's been picked clean, right? So with AI, there's a good opportunity for people here. But basically, trying to circumvent those guardrails, you're not really attacking the AI. You are attacking the um, you're attacking the interface that some developer wrote. Uh, in this particular instance, when you talk to an AI, they um, they remember what you're talking about, right? It's called like the context of the conversation. That's why you can say like, oh, pretend you're pretend you're Deb Wigley, and you're gonna uh, talk about whatever, like some, some interesting, you're, you're Deb Wigley and you're going to be talking about how to make, um, you know, coconut smoothies, go ahead. And then like, now tell me like today's news and it would still be like talking like Deb Wigley, right? Okay. So now all of a sudden pretend that you're Jason Blanchard. Now tell me the same thing on how to make a coconut smoothie. It would be different. It would be the same recipe or whatever, but to have different connotations on how it says it because it knows the context of what it said. And that's all this attack is basically doing is it's, it's asking a ton of questions to either fill up the queue of things um, to, to stage the bot. So then when you ask it about how to make a bomb, it, 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 it's confused because it can't go back far enough or because you're eroding the guardrails slowly and surely until you get to asking the question that isn't a big deal. In fact, honestly, that's a classic technique used by salespeople, right? You don't just walk right in and say like, would you like to buy this really expensive car? They're like, no, like they'll, they'll, they'll be like, oh, hey, like, you know, what are your challenges? What are your problems? Oh, that's frustrating. Like we have this like really, really affordable car that you can buy. Oh yeah. You want to buy, oh, that's great. Hey, you know, for only a couple bucks more, you could buy this mid range car. Why don't you drive that? Right. 
It's the same thing with like popcorn at the movies, right? Like who's not getting the large popcorn and the large soda? It's only a quarter more uh, every time. All right, let's keep going. Opera adds local LLM support. The makers of the Opera browser announced this feature, initially coming to Opera One users opting into developer updates. Users can select from over 150 models, including Meta's Llama and Gemma from Google. All models will initially run on the Olama open source framework, although Opera hopes to expand sources over time. Each model takes at least two gigabytes of storage, and the company isn't optimizing downloads to save space. All right, cool. Um, using LLMs locally, very interesting. Right now, like LLMs, again, is the brain of an AI. Um, when you use LLMs, you typically, um, you know, interface through, you know, like some type of web app portal, right? Chat GPT, whatever. Um, fun fact, I use the Chat GPT mobile app on my phone and uh, it's it's kind of crazy. It's actually really, really cool. Um, you can see it right here, this, this app right here. Come on, snap in on me. That app right there, that's a good one. Um, like you can talk to it like it's a person <laughs> and I use it all the time. Okay. Like, all right. So enough, enough about my personal uh, app usage. Um, Opera has been long known for their browser. So I don't know if they're like branching out or if this is somehow connected into the browser. The nice thing about local LLMs, the, the number one thing about local LLMs, if you're wondering, is that as far as I know, unless there's some shady business going on in the back end, you can put sensitive information into this because it's localized, right? It's not cloud-based. So if you stick all of your secrets into it and ask it a question and then delete it, like there's no, like there, there should not be risk of data breach, data exposure, data leakage because it's local. That, that to me, that would be the one, one compelling reason to use it. Another would be like, say you work at like some remote research base in Antarctica and you only have internet a couple, like 45 minutes a day when a satellite flies over, having a local LLM would be obviously useful because you're not dependent on internet or network connectivity. Again, not a cyber story, but welcome to welcome to modern life where um, you can't enter a conversation without talking about AI. Like I'm just waiting until like I see Bluey talking about AI. Like, oh, hey, bingo, check out my LLM. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Microsoft announces Windows 10 security update pricing. Windows Extended Security Updates, or ESU, are nothing new in the enterprise, but for the first time, Microsoft will offer ESU to consumers on Windows 10. That OS goes out of support on October 14, 2025. The first year of updates costs $61, doubling annually the next two years. Buying in after the first year retroactively will also require paying the year one fee. Businesses using Intune or Windows Auto Patch can purchase ESL at a 25% discount. Microsoft characterized ESL as a bridge to switching to Windows 11 rather than a long-term solution. All right. So it seems that the carousel is coming back around. You know how like when your kids, or if you don't have kids, then please just pretend you have kids for a second. When you put your kids on the carousel and it goes around and you're like, oh, like so happy to see your kids. And then when they disappear, you're like, <laughs> you're just like stone faced. And then when you see them again, you're like, oh, like with Microsoft operating systems and then supporting uh, end of life. Like it, here comes the carousel again. I, we did it with Windows 7. I, you know, I remember it with, you know, Windows XP a million years ago. And here's what I'm talking about. The operating system is going to go end of life, which means it's not going to be supported anymore. But in order to um, like basically wean people off of this drug, um, they will increase the pricing and basically financially penalize you um, to stay on it while still supported so you can uh, migrate off. The idea is, one, Microsoft's focus in their resources on the next operating system. So they're not really interested in continuing to support uh, Windows 10 in this case. So they, they jack up the price a little bit more to compensate for their, you know, for their business. And then two, to make it a financial burden or you know, kind of a stick to financially incentivize businesses to migrate off. Now here's the kicker. Here's the kicker, everybody. Get ready. If you're a squad member, we have a special little emote in here. It's the more you know. If you were an 80s kid, you know what I'm talking about. The 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 shooting star. 
businesses love throwing money at problems, okay? A problem could be a problem, but if you could throw money at it, that's super easy. Every executive knows how to cut a check. Every executive knows how to read like a balance sheet. Hey, uh, we're going, our operating systems are going end of life. We need like, okay, so what do we do, Jerry or BSEC? Well, we got a six month, um, we got a six month roadmap project plan where we're going to upgrade all of the operating systems over a course of time. Uh, we're going to, you're going to have to fly me to the Puerto Rico facility, all these different things. Uh, it's a big effort. Oh God. Are there any other options? Yeah. I mean, we could just stroke a check for $230,000 and continue as it, as is. Yeah, let's do that. That sounds, that sounds easy. And we've got uh, a piggy bank over here full of money. So yes, yes. And, and in reality, it actually still comes out of your IT budget, which totally sucks because now you're getting kneecapped on not being able to, uh, you know, purchase like, you know, whatever new firewalls or hiring staff or whatever. So anyways, the, the, the story here is if you've been in the industry for a while, this is a reality. You'll never read this in a textbook. Businesses will stroke a check in a hot minute if it buys them time to kick the can down the road. Eventually, this will go end of life. And then there's going to be a huge scramble. Like it, it, it happens all the time. There'll be like a huge scramble where like, oh my God, how did we not know? Ugh, right? And then they'll upgrade. Ask anyone, ask anyone who is a system administrator in a Windows environment about servers, right? What is it? Uh, Server, uh, two, is it uh, 2008 R2? Two, or, I'm sorry, now I'm going down a rabbit hole. 2008 R2 is a ser like Microsoft server um, operating system. And in order to upgrade from 2008 R2, which by the way, has it's 2008. That was 16 years ago. It hasn't been supported in like a decade. In order to go from 2008 R2 to the next um, operating system, which I think is 12. I don't even know if you can go 2008 R2 to like, 16 or 20 or whatever they're at now. It's a schema change, which is a massive problem. It's a massive pain in the butt on the back end. So a lot of IT administrators are like, oh, we're good. We're good. We're good. So anyways, this is why our job is hard and why we actually have a job. Let's keep going. Onboarding new cyber talent sets the tone for their tenure with your organization. Ooh, sounds like we are uh, done with the stories. Let me do this really quick. All right, guys, that's going to do it for the show. Let me, uh, let me do that. Hold on. I got all sorts of, no, 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 no. Yes. All right. So we had a, a little bit of a rocky start, but we got through it guys. Solid win. Holy crap. 470 people in chat today. What's up everybody. Wow. Love it. Love it. Love it. Um, I've got to go teach. First, I have to do a wardrobe change since I'm wearing a completely inappropriate shirt <laughs> to be seen as faculty at a university right now. This is borderline, sorry, Kennedy, um, if you know what this says. But we got great jawjacking episode for you. Our good friend DJ b is going to come in. Right before we leave, though, I just want to remind everybody, I'm going to drop this in chat one more time. Uh, Jason Blanchard, a.k.a. Banjo Crashland, Deb Wigley, uh, Rekka Publishing. If you like Anti-Siphon, Black Hills, you're going to really enjoy checking out this Rekka Publishing. So go check that out. Link just dropped. Reminder, uh, Sharice Lamb, our own uh, Simply Cyber community member, she's going to be repping uh, here in a panel. And then the final thing I want to point out is I want to just let everybody know that Shanita has accepted the baton. So Shanita with the Simply Cyber Community Challenge, definitely looking forward to seeing your post on LinkedIn. Shanita, thank you so much for stepping into the light, taking on that challenge and continuing the tradition. Also guys, I, I guess I'm gonna be the guest. Simply Cyber Raid has been taken to a new level. So stay tuned on the socials. I'll let you know uh, how this is gonna come to, come to be at 2 p.m. Eastern time, but I think I'm doing a live stream with ACI Learning. But we'll 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 uh, cross that bridge when we get there. All right, let me let me uh, transition elegantly as I possibly can. Whoop! There we go. All right, guys. So let me go ahead and crash this music. Let's go ahead and bring our neighborhood DJ on, DJ B Sec. Hey, what's up? Oh, there we go. 
Man, I had the same issue you did. I kept having to restart. <laughs> Are you using Chrome? Yeah. Yeah, just burn burn it all to the ground. That's what yeah. we need to do. Just burn it all to the ground. Well, and then I came on and you were there, but you, it was just your face. And then once <laughs> I resized Chrome, then it all fi- then it fixed. Whatever. Oh my god! <laughs> all right. Well, BSEC, what what can people expect from Jaw Jacking today? Uh, just throw questions in. We're going to answer questions, and if we don't have a lot of questions, we got a couple of different uh, stories that I've found. In fact, one just popped up about um, hackers taking over YouTube channels um, and sending out malware. So yeah, that might well, be a good one. It, well, if you do do that particular story, wait five minutes so I can get in the truck and then listen to it because I do have a personally vested interest. Yeah. And, uh... <laughs> and I'll send it to you too. It's a, apparently they're like taking over people that have a good following and then sending stuff out. Yeah. All right. So, hey, just a disclaimer to everybody watching this. I will not send you individually uh, attachments or PDFs or ISO files. No LNK is coming from me. <laughs> uh, so just be mindful of that. All right. Hey, everybody, uh, have a good one. I leave you in the trusty hands of my good friend, DJ Bisek. Thanks to the mods as always. And uh, I'll see you guys later today. Until next time, stay secure. All right, let's jump into it. I got music for us. It's Joe Jack and Ty, people. Throw in your clips or throw in your questions and we will get started. Let's see, did that run? It didn't look like it ran on my side. Hopefully our music's good. I'm trying to I'm watching a playback to see if it actually is actually did run. Because it was supposed to. Alright. It was it did run. Alright, everybody throw your uh, questions in. Anybody got questions? We'll, we'll answer them this morning. Let me get these questions up. All right, I already got one coming in from Live Beats. Oh, let me see here. Let's see if I can. Uh, MFA or 2FA, what would you choose? So, Live Beats Labs, what I would say, and I'm not, I'm not sure if you guys can hear my music or, or not. Um, MFA or 2FA, to me, the more authentication you have, the better, right? The more factors of authentication you have, better. However, you have to take that into consideration with your users, right? If it takes them 14 different types of factors to authenticate to before they can do something, that causes issues when it comes to uh, when it comes to your users into the business. So, 100% 2FA, you got to have at least two factors. If the business will allow you to have more. Or you can get by with having more i would 100 percent go more than two just to have it uh, uh, there let me switch back over oh let's see what we got i would choose christopher gale says i would choose 2fa yeah so when it as it boils down to it just like christopher kale said 2fa 2fa is gonna be where you want to go at least nothing less than 2fa at least 2fa so at least you know a username and password at least um a text message although i would even get rid of going sms like i would make sure that you're using some type of um software authentication key maybe uh like the microsoft uh, authenticator or the google authenticator something along those lines you gotta have um You've got to have more than one factor of authentication for sure. Yeah, just like, uh, looks like all, all Masons agreeing with me. You got to have more than one. There's got to be more than one, at least two. Um, SSD, what do you like the most? Uh, network engineering so i am 
a person that is very much, I want it done and I want it done right now. And one of the things with network engineering, if you do it right, it works. And if you don't, you know, right away. Um, I love making sure that stuff can connect, proving to myself that, Hey, I can connect, uh, a, a machine from, from site a to site B or getting stuff up, allowing our, um, allowing all the users to be able to connect, uh, making sure that the business in itself um, is able to connect um, on on the cheap. So what I like doing is I like looking at or talking to like Comcast, AT&T, all of those big groups, right? And they like, they like to charge you lots of money to connect all of your sites. So what I like learning um, within networking is like SD-WAN. You can use SD-WAN software to find uh, wide area network, you can use that to connect all of your sites, just like AT&T or Verizon or Comcast or any of the big, big uh, telecommunications uh, would connect your site. You can do that by yourself with just an internet connection. So instead of spending 1500 or $2,000 at every single site to have dedicated connections from site to site, you can do that with uh, SD-WAN for a fraction of the cost, $150, $200 with a, a gig network. Let's see, we got Rex. Rex is asking the question of uh, breakfast. So for me, breakfast is, this morning was a smoothie. Um, so two Nutri-Grain bars, two Tall Boys, a Monster, Ultra Zero. Uh, I would 100% stay away from the uh, Monster Zero stuff. That stuff will eat your gut. <laughs> I would stay away from that. Um, let's see what else we got. So Jazzy J. So I'm gonna put my mic away. But what my shirt, what my shirt says, and I'll show you guys. What my shirt says is it gives the definition of Gen X and it says it's a person born between the years of 1961 and two, or 1980 who grew up with minimal supervision, making them resourceful and independent. You can also see the generation that doesn't care about your feelings. So that's what uh, my shirt says. Let me pull the mic whale back up. I've got another one that says Gen X uh, brought up on hose water and neglect, I believe is what it is. All right, going through here, I'm looking for questions. The mods are throwing them in here and I'm also trying to get them so I can throw them up on screen so everybody can see what the questions are. Um, Christopher K. Hall throws in that UB keys are becoming easier to use. UB keys are becoming easier to use and they're better. Jesse J chimed in on the back end and sent me a message that said, yeah, no monster, but he's seen my, uh, he's seen my whiskey collection. Well, whiskey kills the bad stuff. Monsters is there. So stay away from the monster. Let's see what else we got coming in here. Um, Jazzy J's got one. Zim. Let's see what do we have for Zim. Why the dislike of SMS for authentication, cloning, Sim? Yes. So a hundred percent. This is this. When it comes to SMS, it's better than nothing. Correct. But as we've seen through this week, um, and I believe. Uh, I had a, I had a story. I think we already, I think we already saw it once, but, um, as we've seen this week, multiple times, you guys have heard the protocol SS seven SS seven is that underlying protocol for the phone systems for, uh, networking, um, for like AT&T Verizon. That's what that platform runs on. That's what SMS runs on. And it's already been attacked years and years ago so it is not secure and it's been proven time and time again that sms is not as secure as 
an authentication app, a YubiKey or any of that. It's better than nothing. And if you have if you have nothing else but that, then it is what it is. But if you don't have to use that and you have other forms, better forms of authentication, 100% you should be using those. Yeah, Tim McDonald says no to SMS. All right, Carrie. Carrie comes in with a with a deep networking question. It says, "I know that I need to have hands-on experience. What is a good project to do with networking to show you can show you can do the work? That way, I don't look stupid next time I'm gonna ask that in an interview. So, number one, you probably don't look stupid in the interview. Um." I would say number one, an interview, don't ever go above and beyond what you don't know. Don't try to explain something that you don't know. This is for everybody. Like if somebody asks you a question and you just don't know it, don't try to beat around the bush and try to act like you do. Just say you don't know it. That gets you a lot farther than, um, than you trying to BS your way through because they'll see right through that. Number one, number two, Gary, uh, Carrie. There are labs out there. You can get a hold of GNS3. You can get a hold of Packet Tracer. What I would do is, and I don't know how experienced you are in networking, but I would build my own network. And when I say, when, when I'm talking about building a network, when you're talking about corporation networks, you're not talking about a home network. You're not talking about that you have one router and one switch and all your stuff behind it. That to me is not a network. That is called uh a soho like oh a work from home you know small office home office uh network you need to have some type of router to router connection so you're gonna have to have maybe a vpn in between site one and site two and then you're gonna need to have switches behind there that prove that you know how to break stuff out and, or understand the underlying of it like that you you know what VLAN 1, VLAN 10, VLAN 30, 40, 50. And then over here you have that and how you can make sure that on site A and site B that the VLAN 40s connect and can talk to each other, but 40 can't see 30 on the other side or on its own side. There's a lot to it, um, but there are labs out there that teach you that. Uh, look up, you can go look up on YouTube for GNS3. GNS3 um, allows you to pull everything in. So you can pull in Cisco routers, Cisco switches, you can pull in hardware, but in a virtualized area. So you don't need to go out and spend all the money for the hardware itself. Build that up and then practice um, just creating a, creating a small network. You don't need to take it into this massive network, but what you need to prove and, and show that you understand is how sites connect to each other and then how at those sites your, your endpoints are connecting as well and how you can determine what's going on on those endpoints. That is where I go. All right. What do we got here? We've got, um, so I got the one from Carrie is in. I have a job interview today for a compliance and risk analysis with a city. Any must mentions Robert, I would for compliance and risk. Um, I don't see the question in here. It's probably a lot all the way down. Um, I would, I would 100% with compliance and risk mention that you stay up to date, um, daily by coming here. Number one, just so people understand that you're, you're on top of the game. You're understanding you, each day you're looking at what risks are out there. Um, it it kind of shows them that you're uh, paying attention to the whole scheme of what's going on uh, in the cyber realm, and show them that that you it shows them that you're you're very interested in what's going on. Number one, um, risk and compliance. Um, when I see governance, risk and compliance stuff, for me it's a lot about policies, procedures, making sure that. 
things are in place um auditing and so forth so i don't know what your what your complete background is but the the must mention for me would be just be to make sure that you can convey to them that you know you have a way of keeping up with everything on a daily basis got a lot of a lot of gen x love up in here awesome um let's see what else we got going on let's see one from jason summers and hey, michael uh ian michael's asking if i UB keys and the latest phishing attacks have you heard or know anything about it i have not seen that i may have seen one article but i i don't i haven't heard of heard about it or read about it um i'll have to go in and look at that let's see what this one is jason summers can i take any siphon trainings with the pay what you can option later on if i can't make them live um i don't know if they do that i don't know if they save everything i know if you pay for it um i know you have access if you pay for a certain amount i know you have access to the labs and so forth i'm not sure maybe uh one of the mods maybe josh or somebody can can enlighten us i don't know if they actually record everything for you to take or, or for you to go back and watch I know you still do have access to labs and stuff if you're paying for it. Raymond Cruz, what about low hanging fruit? Okay, let me see if I can find Raymond so we can put that up here. Um, all right, Raymond Cruz, here we go. What are the low hanging fruit while sh troubleshooting inability to SSH into a Cisco switch? Assume, assuming that you can console into the switch what are you checking assume the crypto keys are not the issue are you are you trying to troubleshoot a switch and you're trying to ask me what the low-hanging fruit is um let's see what are low-hanging fruit while troubleshooting the inability to ssh into cisco switch i mean if you have ssh turned on on the cisco switch you're gonna get in if you don't have the correct keys or um if the if the keys are fine but you, they're they're old keys meaning they're old crypto keys that are deprecated depending on the software that you're using like if you're using putty or something along those lines to ssh into it um it'll come up and tell you that it, it won't connect because those it, it no longer allows those crypto keys in there so um that's where i would start number one and then if you can get on to uh, uh did say assuming you could console into the switch. so if you can console into the switch um that's the first thing i go look at go look at the crypto keys that are valid within um in the switch or in the router itself um if it's an older switch or router then that means more than likely it's using older uh cryptography the older keys and you you've got to remove you either you have to do one of two things you have to remove the older um crypto keys and move them to a higher level or you have to go in on your ssh tool and add those keys back in because more than likely they've been uh they've been deprecated off or they've been commented out and not allow you to connect to it i've seen that i've had that issue before so Let's see, Carrie saying, I was asked last time and told him I just had book knowledge and he just looked at me like I was a noob. Well, I mean, I think that's where a lot of us um, need to need to realize that. And, and I know Jerry said it. Um, I'm sure Eric has said it a couple of times. And I've, I've even said this on uh, on Slay Security Plus a couple of times with Jesse and in some of the chats on Discord book knowledge is great it gives you the underlying theory of what's going on but just because you read the book doesn't 
mean that you know what to do when you put your hands on the keyboard. Hands on the keyboard are completely different. You can understand that to connect to VLAN 1 and VLAN 1 here, that they have to hit the router and they have to do that. But until you actually physically do that at some point and understand that, oh, look, I've got all the routing set up, but it's still not working. How do I fix that? That's where the troubleshooting comes into place. That's where the understanding, the actual uh, setup comes into place. Theory and books and all that are great, but you have to understand the technology and understand why something's not working. If that makes sense. Let's say we got, uh, I think ACI learning has stuff on. So Christopher K Hall is saying ACI learning may have stuff on GNS three. Let's see. We're doing a lot of, uh, they blow it up some. I think this is probably going to be, it's got to be under it, right? Uh, no, let's go to, well. Let's see if we can filter it. There you go. Perfect. So you've got, there you go, Carrie online. Uh, who, who put that on here? Christopher K hall. Um, ACI learning has a hands-on GNS three course and it's only two hours long. Um, is it a free course? It says it's on demand. Let's see. That's one minute. Here are all the topics we covered. We've got 12 episodes. It doesn't break everything down. So it looks like you have to have a paid subscription, but I mean, there you go right there. Um, so a hands-on review, GNS3 Essentials, a uh, short series that will help you get GNS3 up and running. Um, it looks like they're gonna use Cisco IOS with dynamic IP images um, and use Cisco viral images as well. So. That's, there you go. Now understand um, when it comes to GS3, a lot of the stuff is Cisco based because those are the, that's the firmware that's out there that they can use. Those are the, um, that's the software that, that runs on it. You can get others to run on it. Um, but what I want everybody to understand is even though you're using Cisco, a lot of the stuff is agnostic across the board. What you're learning doing the Cisco stuff translates to whether you're using um, you know, Juniper or Comscope, Ruckus stuff. It, it's all the same. The, the naming may be different. Like over in Cisco, they're called trunks. Um, over on another one, they, they, they may be called something else. That That's it. That's all it is. It's still the same technology. It's still everything. Um, everything within it is, is all the same. We got today's headlines. Um, let's see what this one is. Gil is saying, do you think that is a good idea to say to the interviewer? I don't know that good, but I will do what I can to oh, 100%. So, um, when I interview people for a job and I ask them a question within a couple of seconds, you understand whether or not they actually understand the question and understand um, what you're asking for, or if they don't. And I would much rather somebody look at me in the eyes and say, I have no clue what that is, but I will, I could figure it out and move on. As opposed to sitting there and trying to give me some run around thing of how they do, how they would do X and how they would do Y and how they're gonna do Z and then how that's gonna make it better. Just say, hey, I, I don't know. Like my skills aren't to that that level right now. Um, you're hiring me to do the job. I will figure out a way to get it done. And and understand that usually a hiring manager, usually when you're coming in, you're not coming in as the end all be all for everything. I don't know what that was. You're not coming in as the end all be all for everything. Um, 
and that you usually have somebody that's working with you and they're going to know the systems. I, in fact, I was talking to somebody, I believe it was yesterday. And we were talking about, you know, when you leave jobs and going to another job, you can be a veteran. You can like for me, 20, 25 years in, in the industry, um, doing it, doing security. If I left my job now and went to another one, I'd have 100% uh, the in my head that I don't know what's going on because you don't understand that company's infrastructure. You don't know what it is. And until you get in there and learn it, you're going to feel that way. I'd have imposter syndrome out the yin yang, right? Because I don't know what it is. Now, I know I'm capable of getting onto a switch and updating it or doing this, but also if I were to go get on their switch or go get on a router or go get on a server or do something with their um, security stuff, I don't know what my change in their environment is going to break or fix. In the current environment I'm in, because I've been in there for a while, I know everything that's going to happen. So realize that when you go in for an interview and you're asking and you're asking a question, giving an answer of I'm not 100% 100% sure but I can look it up and find out the question or find out the answer is a, is, is a perfect answer. I hope everybody agrees with me on that one. Cause that's, that's one of my uh, pet peeves is people just trying to, to tell you that they understand something or know it. And they don't just tell me, you don't know it. And let's, let's, you can learn. That's what, that's what we're all here for. We're always learning. You can't, you don't know everything in it. And every single day is a new step. Okay, so SSD is asking, um, I'd like to know more about the SD WAN being cheaper. Um, SD WAN is cheaper in the sense of all you need is an internet connection. So when you're running everything, when you go to AT&T or whatever, um, whatever ISP you're, you're working with, if you have them connect their equipment, like if you have site A, site B and site C, and you, you have them connect their equipment together and they're running all of the stuff, they charge you more. They charge you to put in more than likely they'll probably put in MPLS or they may put in their own version of SD-WAN, but they'll charge you probably five or 10 times more than what it would be if you did it yourself. Um, there are, there are devices out there that allow you to, to build up SD-WAN out by yourself. So then instead of it costing a thousand, say, we'll say a thousand dollars, we'll use easy numbers. Say it costs you a thousand dollars to go have AT&T put in a connection at um, each individual site. So that's $3,000 a month to have those sites connected, right? And they're running all of their protocols. Their network engineers are doing everything. They're keeping it all connected. And for the most part, so everybody understands for the most part, when a network is on and everything's connected and good for the most part, it's set it and forget it. Once you've got it set and you're good, now it's just main, maintaining. You're not changing a lot of stuff over the time. So now it's costing me $3,000 to have um, ISP one do all this information. Now, if I come over here and I do it myself and I set this up, now I can have ISP one at site one, I could have ISP two at site two. I could have ISP three at site three. It doesn't matter who I'm using. I can go and get the cheapest internet and the fastest speed from whichever provider I want. And then I hook those in together myself. So maybe it only costs me $150 per site. So now I'm up, now I'm at $450 to have all my sites connected a month versus 3000. If that makes sense. That's how you can save money. That's how you get the ROI. Now understand when you go buy the equipment, originally you're going to have an upfront cost. Um, usually that cost is going to be a CapEx cost. And then um, your connections for for each month is going to be an OpEx cost. That's That gets into more accounting and stuff like that. But that CapEx cost is drawn out over an amount of time. So say you bought the equipment and that CapEx cost is over five years. So if it, it costs you thousand dollars per device that you put in that's a thousand dollars that's three thousand dollars spread out over 60 months right as opposed to three thousand dollars a month for that so there's there's a big cost savings in there 
can be. Um, it looks like Alan Escobar, I have Proxmox. Do you know of any labs I can do? Networking labs. Um, Alan, I, I don't, I have not looked at the Proxmox. I know there's a lot of people right now, um, that are putting videos out on YouTube for Proxmox versus VMware and, um, working on transitioning from VMware to Proxmox. So I would go research that on, on YouTube. I don't have any direct experience with Proxmox right now, but it's definitely something I'm looking at as well because it's a big deal. Oh, Jerry came in with the, I think this comes back to the question before, uh, came in with, make sure you don't have an ACL blocking, um, your, uh, connection into that switch for SSH. That's another one. Uh, more than likely if you're connecting to it, but it doesn't actually allow you to connect into it, it's going to be something along the, uh, along the lines of that, those keys. Let's see. I'm looking for Gil's question. He's got a question in here. Kind of far behind. We got, we had a lot of questions this morning. Good questions. Um, KL. Gil's asking, do you think it is a good idea to say interview? Oh, I already did that one. Um, and then Ian Michaels talking about UB keys. I didn't see that one. Scroll through. It looks like everything's out of mod chat. I'm scrolling down. Let's see. It is 827. I think Jerry is probably still, hopefully Jerry is probably still driving. Let's, let's go through this real quick with, uh, the YouTube hack. Um, so Jerry can hear this and then I'll send this over to him. So what it's saying is hijackers or attackers are hijacking YouTube channels to steal your data. And basically what it's saying is, uh, let me see here. It says, uh, criminals are exploiting YouTube to conduct sophisticated malware attacks. Number one, then it says, uh, they're targeting users. Uh, especially the young ones with free software and video game enhancements as bait. I would assume we're talking about Robux here. Um, something along those lines. Uh, innocuous looking videos offer pirated software and game cracks leading to malware. Popular games aimed at children are frequently used to lure victims. Uh, ver verified YouTube accounts with large followings are, are getting compromised and they're using those. Uh, it looks like it says many YouTube accounts seem to be compromised and used to distribute uh, malware. The compromised accounts cloak threat. Many YouTube accounts distributing the malware. The videos appear to have been compromised or acquired from legitimate users. So Jerry, watch out. They're going to come for your account. Um, videos include links to password protected files on media Mediafire that contain the malware. Uh, malware identified includes Viter Stealer and targeting sensitive information. And this, so I think the uh, crux of everything with this one is monitor what your kids are doing on YouTube. Um, the, it looks like this is uh, pointed directly at uh, younger the younger kids to make sure that, uh, it's, like I said, it's probably for Roblox It's probably for those games that you get to download for free and then, uh, turn around and get to have to pay while you're playing. Um, so yeah, monitor what your kids are doing. looks like there's something for discord in here as well. Discord servers are now being used to distribute malware, instructing users to disable antivirus. Well, that's even, that's better. So now we've got kids that are on probably more than likely they're on the discord channel. And then people are sending messages in discord telling people to, Hey, for this to work, you're going to have to disable your, your antivirus that I don't know if y'all can see this. Kind of looks small on screen. Oh, that's, that's really big. Um, so yeah. Um, in the end, I would say, let's make sure that, uh, we're watching our, our young ones that, um, are playing these games. 
because it looks like that's where where this is being pointed at and we all know everybody's kids sit out and live on youtube to to do things oh i see a good question coming in. i got time for about one or two more questions um this one is from leatherneck let me go I don't see it in here, but I've got one from Leatherneck. It says, um, how concerned should we be about lateral movement in our organization using Microsoft O365 with the latest compromise and accesses in the threat actor has? Um, so there, I'm not sure which latest compromise you're talking about. If you're talking about what we, what was on this morning, that was actually a compromise that happened a while back. Um, and that was just a report out for it. As it relates to O365, um, I wouldn't be as as uh, concerned about local machines. I would be more concerned about your O365. And you need to realize there's a difference between O365 and M365, but you need to be concerned about that environment, watching that environment, depending on um, what services you, you actually have in those environments uh, would depend on what you can actually see. The logging, I believe, because of uh, because of what happened with Microsoft, Microsoft actually turned on uh, logging. I think they had it for 60 days and they bumped it up to 120 or 180 in Microsoft purview. So all your logs are now kept for longer times in there. So you can all you can go through uh, Microsoft purview and uh, validate logs through there. Let me switch back over. There's always a concern um, for everything, but using Microsoft Purview, if you if you're in M365, you can use the threat hunting um, section within there to look at uh, different types of machines. If we're using Microsoft Intune, then now you've got your machines connected in, and they're they're giving back analytics. You could use that information to see. There are ways to go through and make sure that your environment is safe and secure or safe and secure that you can make it. Um, but as anything, you, you've got to stay on your toes. Uh, haircut fish for a sock analyst role. What do you feel is more important learning a programming language or database language for sock analyst? I don't think either one of them. Um, it depends on what, what software you're going to be using and, knowing how to write the queries for the software or for the sim that you're using or are looking at in in my in my opinion now take the word sock analyst out of that and you can be sitting there and do it but i would say learning a programming language or a scripting language is probably number one on the list not necessarily a database language Jerry's chiming in and says, Hey, we are going to raid today. John Strand is going to make it to the, to the stream. So it's just a raid. Jerry is not going to be, uh, participating, but he will be around for the raid. I'm sure. All right. We got one last question and it comes from Chris Frazier says, what do you think of copilot and how it can help with writing scripts? I'm using it and God, it is a lifesaver. Okay. Frazier. I hope you're still here, Fraser, because I got a, a hot take on this one. So I'm using both. I'm using both Copilot. I am using ChatGPT. Put them side by side, ask them the same question, and find out what comes out. Copilot um, will give you what you need. It'll give you what you need to survive, right? ChatGPT gives you a better script. It condenses it. It does everything quick and fast. Um, some of the stuff, because Copilot is quote unquote newer, um, and the LLM probably doesn't have as much in there, you would think, and also, you would think that Copilot, because it's Microsoft, would give you a more uh, precise and pristine uh, script. It doesn't. ChatGBT gives you a better one. Um, that's not to say that Copilot isn't going to, you know, pass it up soon, but right now, um, both work, uh, both work fine. But if you want a, a two page script, you can get it from Copilot. If you want a half a page script that does the exact same thing, you can get it from ChatGPT. But yes, I use both of them 
and I use both of them and run the scripts side by side to see and make sure that they both work and they do. It's just chat GPT knows how to condense that script down more. All right. That's going to be it for me. It's 835. Loved all the questions. Great questions today. People coming in hot today with questions. Um, I want everybody to, uh, to remember that today at 430 Eastern time, Jerry has his fireside chat with Jason Haddix um, at 7 p.m. tonight. We have Slay Security with Jesse J. Um, don't forget, I uh, believe, was it 2 p.m. Eastern? 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, we've got the raid. We have the cyber. Uh, the, uh, we have the daily cyber brief raid. We're going to raid over to uh, the ACI Learning and check them out. But for me, that's going to be it for today. I hope everybody had a had a great morning. Love to see everybody here. I hope to see everybody tomorrow for the Daily Cyber Brief. Have a great day. And as always, let's make sure that us and everybody around us is staying secure. Until tomorrow. If you enjoyed that content, keep the cybersecurity train going by connecting with the other Simply Cyber community resources. We have the Discord server that's lively and always keeps the conversation going. You can connect with me directly on LinkedIn. And also every single weekday morning on the Simply Cyber channel, we're doing live daily cyber threat briefings, 8 a.m. Eastern time, as well as Thursday at 4.30 p.m. We're doing live stream interviews with industry experts, and we produce videos that we push out every Wednesday morning. I'm Jerry from Simply Cyber. I hope you enjoyed the content, and we'll see you in the next one.